All right, so good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for the third and final session in the Aerial Monitoring of Aquatic Systems webinar series. Uh, my name is Amy Poles, and I'm moderating today's webinar. Uh, so I work for the USGS, where all of my time is dedicated to the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership, or PNAMP for short. And PNAMP, along with StreamNet, co-led the planning uh, of this webinar series. And then um, we had an, a planning group as well that included 13 people from a variety of organizations. And so I'm joined today by one of my fellow planning group members, uh, Ken Petro from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. And Ken inspired today's lineup and he'll be helping with speaker introductions uh, in just a bit. And then to keep my computer uh, from freezing up, I'm actually going to kill my camera um, in incoming video to help things run more smoothly. Okay. So with that done, uh, here is today's agenda. Uh, after I wrap up the welcome, we'll do a quick icebreaker, and then we'll hear from the presenters. Uh, we're planning on 30-minute uh, presentations with about five minutes for questions immediately following each presentation, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for additional questions or open discussion. Uh, first, uh, just some quick tips on navigating the meeting platform. Um, please do mute yourself when you're not speaking. If you're on the phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. And if you're using your computer audio, um, you're, you mute and unmute yourself using the microphone icon on the toolbar. Um, and then Microsoft has been rolling out changes to Teams. Um, so how you get to your toolbar will vary depending on which version you're using. Uh, in the old version, you can make the toolbar appear by hovering your mouse over the meeting window and the new version toolbar is just always present at the top right of the meeting window. Um, regardless of the version, the icons are the same, but they might appear in a different order than what I have on this slide. Um, if you are having trouble with your audio, check your device settings, which you can get to from those three dots in the middle of the toolbar. Uh, and you can always use the meeting chat to contact uh, us, the organizers, and we'll do our best to help you out. And then when we get to the Q&A, if you have a question, uh, you have the option to type your question into the chat, or you can click on that hand icon on the toolbar uh, to raise your hand, and then we'll call on folks to unmute their audio to ask their questions. All right, so let's put some of those tips to use. Um, and just for fun, we wanna know a little something about you. Um, so we're gonna do a quick poll in Mentimeter. Uh, so if you all take a second and open up your chat, you'll find that my coworker Sam has posted a link to the icebreaker question. Again, to get to the chat, you click on that speech bubble icon to open the chat sidebar, and you should see a link to the icebreaker question that Sam has posted. Um, so if you would just humor me and take 30 seconds and fill out that poll, um, I'd appreciate it. So it looks like results are rolling in. Let's see, let's see what we've got so far. Uh, all right, <laughs> oh, people are more adventurous than I am. <laughs> I'm squarely in the in the no category. Maybe a maybe. I don't know. Um, definitely not ready to to leave planet Earth just yet. Got another second. But right now, the maybes are winning. So many people willing to go. I am a little surprised. <laughs> okay. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, but um, if you had trouble finding the, the link in the chat, um, you can also get to Menti using going, you can go to menti.com and use that code up at the top. All right. Dueling it out for yes and maybe. Um, all right. That was fun. Thanks so much for participating. Um, we're going to use live polling again, so this is kind of a warm up for later. Uh, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Ken Fetcho now uh, while Misha takes the presenter role and gets his slides up. All right. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everybody. My name is Ken Fetcho, and I am the Effectiveness Monitoring Coordinator and Tribal Liaison at the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, or OEB. And I was really happy to participate in planning this webinar series with the other planning group members, uh, the speakers, and Amy. Uh, this forum and others like it are really important in sharing information to allow our staff and grantees to learn more about the latest technology to plan and monitor restoration projects to improve watershed conditions. 
Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome and introduce our first speaker, Misha Hay. Uh, Misha lives in Corvallis, Oregon, and serves as Quantum Spatial's Senior Technical Domain Expert. Uh, with over 15 years of direct experience developing applied GIS solutions. Uh, Misha works primarily in development and deployment of biophysical modeling analytics derived from remote sensing data. His current focus includes forest timber inventory, hydrology network and wetland mapping, and terrestrial and riverine habitat modeling. Uh, today, Misha will be giving his talk on characterizing riverine fish habitat using bathymetric LIDAR. Uh, so welcome, Misha, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Ken. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll apologize in advance if the delivery guy go shows up. My uh, dog's <laughs> going to go bananas. Um, but hopefully I managed to exhaust him this morning and we'll get through this uh, with some silence. Um, Feel free to type questions whenever you want. I'm not sure I'll be able to see the chat and present at the same time, but I'm happy to treat this as uh, fluidly as a virtual presentation allows. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, kind of a relatively new technology, bathymetric LIDAR. I expect many of the folks on the call are familiar with um, topographic LIDAR uh, as a general rule, but um, we'll talk about some of the differences. Um, why I think this is a really cool technology for the, the kind of stuff you guys are doing, um, some of the analytics I'm trying to build on top of these data sets, uh, many of which will probably seem familiar to, to a lot of folks, and um, show a bunch of pretty pictures. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to give a general overview of the technology. Um, talk about how to integrate some additional um, data from uh, sonar, some of the data applications, uh, general challenges in the processing and analyses, and then a quick summary. So uh, light detection and ranging data. Um, basically how this works is it's a really, really fancy laser range finder. Um, so everybody's familiar with the concept of a laser rangefinder. You hit the button, it shoots a laser out, tells you how far away that is. When you tie that to GPS satellites, base stations, and what's called a IMU, an inertial measurement unit, you can start to get exact positioning of those laser pulses based on the position and orientation of the aircraft. So. Traditional LIDAR um, operates in the near IR spectrum that is absorbed by water. And so it has no utility in mapping um, aquatic habitat if it's actually submerged. Um, the bathymetric LIDAR operates in a, in a green wavelength, um, 532 nanometers for those uh, spectral geeks. Um, and it allows rapid survey of shallow water areas or um, difficult or dangerous or impossible areas to get at um, using either um, RTK, like you see, um, that's, that's me 15 years ago uh, measuring the South Slough. In one step, I'm going to overtop my waders, and I'm 6'4", so most people already would have. So the, the uh, graphic on the lower left is really meant to indicate the applicability of this in different conditions. So um, different survey vessels will operate in deep water systems, um, but they always hit a point at which a, a sonar system either doesn't work or the ship is unable to access shallow water. Uh, the system itself, the current, um, the current sensor, state of the state of the art sensor that uh, Quantum deploys and is really considered the industry standard, is the Regal VQ880G. Um, so the the NIR sensor um, has a scan pattern that is 
linear and directly underneath the aircraft. But because the green sensor is actually trying to see through water, it has a circular pattern. Um, for anyone who's tried to see through water with uh, traditional imagery, you know that sun glare and reflectivity off the surface is a real problem. And so that's why it has a circular scan pattern. Um, super high pulse rate, I think that that's even doubled since I made this slide. Um, full waveform, uh, I'm not going to get into the waveform side of things because it's the analytics around it are complicated and it's still kind of a, um, a difficult thing to, to push through and extract valuable information without the sensor-specific software. Um, Typically, these sensors will see uh, 1.5 secchi depths, um, which is basically how far visible light, secchi depth is how far visible light trans, transmits through the water column. Um, you can adjust the beam divergence. It's got a super short pulse length. Uh, this is what the sensor looks like. Uh, this is in a fixed wing aircraft. I believe it's a, a caravan. Um, but we have deployed this in uh, helicopter systems and for some of the really uh, mountainous or high meander rivers a helicopter system is a lot more effective at the at the mapping um, and here's just the kind of operational parameters between the the two types of lidar typically topographic lidar uh, we can fly substantially higher um, then the green LIDAR, largely due to the, um, the different wavelengths and eye safety associated with it, so the amount of energy that's dispersed per pulse. So this, is, uh, this applies to really both green and red, but um, we're going to focus on the green here. So the transmit wave comes out as a tight normal distribution um, as you can see but then once it hits stuff on the ground it comes back with a water surface return is the first spike we typically get some uh, water column backscatter in between and then we get a bottom return um, so the the waveform coming back from the system has multiple spikes when you're talking about a a green sensor in water but if I were shooting a, shooting the same system at a parking lot, for example, you'd get a single uh, spike return. Um, we do have some attenuation of the laser uh, signal in water. Um, turbidity, among other things, affects the penetration and, and detection of bottom returns. And one of the, the cool things about the green and complicated um, is that you know, as you guys probably know, light moves at a different speed and changes direction when it uh, moves between air and water medium. And so we actually need to account for that refraction in order to get an accurate location of the bottom depth. Um, starting in with the pretty pictures. So you can see the difference between what you would get from a near infrared collect there on the top left and then how much detail you get um, from the green collect or the, the topobathy collect underneath the water surface there in the bottom majority of the picture. And we'll have lots of these pictures uh, as we as we move along. There's a little cross section of uh, the actual points associated. So you can see the water surface in the dark blue and then all the bathymetry points in orange along the bottom. Um, of that top cross section. Uh, just another cool picture. This is, I believe, this is from the Skagit River. Um, so this is actually just a green collect. We did not fly a topo bath or um, topo, an NIR system at the same time, but it's a great illustration of the additional information that you'll get. So this is everything above the water. And that's all the detail that we get below the water with the with the green system. So um, anything that's really difficult to access, uh, particularly with a sonar boat, you can start to to pull out some really incredible detail in uh, the bottom of some of these pools. 
doesn't always work that well though. Um, highly aerated waves. So if we're going over uh, rapids, um, we typically lose a, a lot of the penetrability to the water. Obviously, turbid, muddy water that you can't see through at all. Um, people keep wanting us to fly the Mississippi, and we keep having to tell them that it's just not the technology for that. Um, and then heavy aquatic vegetation, you know, this is this is a laser. It's visible light. And so if we're trying to shoot through something that light is not penetrating, we're not going to get a good model. Um, so if you're considering this stuff, um, you got to think about the system that you're really trying to deploy. Typical classification of this, um, we have vegetation or above ground default, depending on um, whether we're in a city or not. We, we can also mask out or classify out buildings and power lines if, if those are um, a, a feature of interest or you want to get rid of them. And then we have a water surface so you can tell the, the actual flow levels at the time of the collect and then the bathymetric bottom. Um, underneath that. Like I said, there is uh, typically some water column noise. We're starting to be able to um, differentiate the water column noise from, say, a subaquatic vegetation, depending on the depending on the um, particular system. And that's where we're hoping that uh, some of the other things I'm going to show today really start to to help pull out more information about what's going on as far as uh, habitat relevant submerged features. Um, just another pretty picture. Well, it's not pretty yet, but um, this is a topographic dam with the water all masked out. Um, and then you get all this additional resolution, uh, additional detail. You can see big pools and um, where the main channels are going. Um, features for as far as uh, sandbars and things along those lines underwater, how the, the ripples might uh, might manifest. Um, and we can start to look at vegetation. So uh, riparian veg is a is an easy byproduct out of this this type of data data collect. Uh, and that's what a, a, I think this is about a one meter cross section, um, might be a little more than that, but um, just that little cross section, let me, let me back up. Yeah, this little cross section over here is what we're looking at. Just to zoom in, um, drops down, you can see a couple meters in the shallow points and then again you can start to map overhanging or riparian vegetation as as appropriate for your particular question more pretty pictures um, i think this is the tacannon river uh, this is what it looked like in 2010 with the near ir system um, the the point density uh, or sorry, the the pulse rate of these systems has uh, substantially improved since 2010. So um, this might look a little chunky to those of you who have been looking at, at more modern LIDAR. Um, this is what it looked like in 2017. You can see our resolution is a little improved. The ground model is a little cleaner. Um, you're still looking at uh, tinning across the water surface there. Um, because we're only looking at the topo points and then mask out the water. And again, you can start to see all these submerged channel characteristics um, from the bathymetric LIDAR. Quick cross section. Um, so all of this stuff is derived from these individual laser points. And so if you compare the 2010 and 2017 for this particular project, you can see the river channel has moved pretty dramatically. Again, the, 
the NIR from 2010 is not penetrating the water, but that's definitely the deep point. And you can see a big change in um, the, the channel location over the seven years between collects. One other thing that uh, we really hope is going to show a lot of, or is showing a lot of promise and we hope to, to be able to deploy some analytics on, um, we are working with Oregon State at the moment to, um, to develop this derivative. But remember when, we, when I showed you the, uh, the waveform coming back to the system, it had a certain amplitude at those uh, peaks. And that can be considered the intensity of the return. And so a map, I think it's in the Florida Keys of subsurface intensity or, or reflectance. So you're getting a, a spectral image of what's happening on the, underneath the water on the, on the sea floor in this case. And um, we're still trying to, to optimize the normalization for depth and um, some of the other components of acquisition that I won't get too into, but my hope is that this can start to help detect additional features not structurally available from the LiDAR cloud, but spectrally available in um, the intensity of those returns within riverine systems. Currently, we're, we're really focused on the, the benthic side of things um, on the East Coast, but once this technology or once the processing for this data is is squared away and i can get a few projects interested in looking at this um, my hope is that the the riverine intensity is uh relatively useful for habitat assessment and monitoring um like i said one of the major uh advantages to this system is it can get places that other things cannot. Um, so this is a pool in the headwaters of the Skagit River that's about 10 or 12 meters deep, totally inaccessible to boats. Um, nobody's really 10 or 12 meters tall to be able to, to do it with a traditional topo uh, RTK survey. So um, this technology is really the, the only way to start assessing some of these features. The turbidity, like I said, is is a bit of a problem. Um, this is a project in uh, Kalamazoo River in Michigan. It's far muddier uh, than the stuff we're we're typically used to out here, and so you start to need to to fill in areas that the the lidar system doesn't map. And I'll show a few more examples of that. But this is the Kalamazoo River in Michigan. Um, it's a topo bathy collect, which is because the green uh, the green laser also gets returns off the um, terrestrial features. Uh, we call it a topo bathymetric sensor, and then we integrated that with a sonar collect, a multi beam sonar collect, to get a, a nice seamless model here. So the topo bathy, bathymetric LIDAR there in CAN um, really did a great job of mapping all of the shallow areas, largely inaccessible by boat. And then it allowed the sonar group to come in and focus their collect specifically on areas that we didn't map. So ideally we fly a, a, LIDAR, a LIDAR collect, process everything, show where we did not effectively map and then can substantially reduce of a, of a ground-based or boat-based survey. If all this stuff is collected right, um, it integrates almost perfectly seamlessly. Um, our biggest issue with integrating is typically, excuse me, <coughs> is typically uh, temporal discrepancies over time, as you guys are sure you're aware uh rivers and subaquatic systems are inherently dynamic 
and um, ideally you collect the LIDAR at a low flow and the sonar at a high flow so you get nice overlap, but that can also result in some, some true change. Once again, uh, sonar in the blue-green color ramp, um, topographic in the blue polygons there, and then the bathymetric LIDAR is everything in between. Um, and so it's really the fusion of these technologies that, that give you a, a truly comprehensive picture of the, the terrain within the site. Um, depending on your river system, some of the some systems we we map really really well with just the bathymetric system. But even in these more complex or turbid areas, um, the the bathymetric system, uh, the bathymetric lidar, uh, really reduces the effort and improves the overall coverage. Once again, just a cool picture of how this data integrates. Uh, this is all from the Kalamazoo River. Once again. Um, this one's a little closer to home, so um, you guys are, most of you are probably familiar with the, the Klamath River dam removal. Um, we flew that with uh, the bathymetric LIDAR, integrated it with um, sonar in the areas that we didn't collect to support the, the removal and engineering planning. Rough idea of the uh, of where the system succeeds and fails. Um, so the LIDAR here is in the blue and green, and then some of these deep pools or riffles that you can see, or typically pools in this image, are currently covered by the hash mark. And as our sonar, um, the, the sonar uh, engineers um, collected that, processed it perfectly, and it tied really nicely into our data. Um, so again, we're capturing the, the shallow really effectively, able to focus their efforts on the, the deep stuff that we missed. And as long as everybody does everything right, it comes out really nicely. So I'm going to try to switch over to my Mentimeter question. How'd that work? Hmm. There we go. Close enough. So, um, if you guys can take a second to uh, log into the or the chat, I think somebody just sent out. I can't see. Yep, Sam just oh, put the, the link in the chat. And you thank just you. Go back. Are you going to go back to the display? I am going to go wait? back. <laughs> there we go. So it. Too many, too many buttons. Give this a minute since there's a lot of folks on the call. I like the live update. Mm, geomorphic character pulling ahead. How many people did we have on the call? 50 something? Well, let me look. I think we've had a few more join. We're up to 86. Oh, 86. Sorry. Right. But don't don't wait for all 86 to weigh in. Uh, I'll, I'll wait till things stop moving around for a second because I'm actually curious about folks' answers. One more for depth. All right, geomorphic characters still still in the lead. You're right, this is fun. <laughs> All right, let's call that good. Um, so oh, one more for in-stream wood. Obviously, uh, these things are all important. Um, the actual answer, however, is Sean Connery. So Unfortunately, um, we're not very good at mapping Sean Connery with uh, airborne remote sensing, 
But a lot of the other things that you guys felt were interesting, um, we are pretty good at mapping. So we're going to focus on those. We're back. OK. So that was about the data. Um, cool data. What do we do now? Um, so we're trying to, some of the things I'm focused on, or we as a company are focused on, um, channel characteristics, uh, pools, slope, habitat, potential, riffles, runs, all those uh, geomorphic character features, uh, coarse woody debris. Uh, we can look at reach geometry, complexity, sinuosity, um, floodplain and floodplain connectivity. Um, change detection as far as how the um, substrate is, is moving around within the river channel if over multiple collections, so erosion, deposition, um, general sediment transport, uh, water volumes, all kinds of stuff. And we're going to walk through some examples of that. Uh, so reach geometry. Um, people have been using uh, uh, topographic LIDAR to support um, reach geometry development for hydraulic modeling um, for some time now. I mean, probably better than a decade. And then they're going in and, and often filling in those those transects uh, in the subsurface areas that are sub submerged areas where the LIDAR doesn't doesn't collect. But now the LIDAR will often collect that for you. Um, so it's a it's a real advantage as far as developing transects with complete reach geometry. You can pull out the banks from just the elevation data. You can look at how uh, vegetation um, spans that reach. Uh, we can. This yep. is Amy. Uh, I just want to let you know you have about five minutes to wrap up. Oh, wow. Talk uh, slow. All right. Plenty of time. Um, so we can look at channel complexity. Um, because we can strip away all the vegetation, we can detect all kinds of uh, channels in the floodplain that are not readily um, discernible from field surveys. Uh, we can start to map coarse woody debris both structurally and spectrally. Um, I don't like the, my graphic here. It's a bit cartoony, but here's a couple others that are a little better. So this was a really clean system. We can actually tell you that's a 40 centimeter log. We can tell you how deep it is, and we can start to quantify the actual volume um, underneath the water. Um, floodplain mapping, a, a pretty, pretty obvious application for this stuff. Um, this is... Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, I think, just showing how the inundation might change. Uh, let's see if my graphic works. Uh, same kind of thing for rivers. So uh, relative water surface, as we iteratively grow the water surface on this little floodplain, you can see how different components get um, connected or disconnected. We can display that in a static uh, system and none of this is super revolutionary as far as what people are doing. What's really revolutionary is the amount of area we can cover. So suddenly we can do hundreds of miles instead of focus on really small um, reaches that are that can be mapped in the field. We can rapidly assess uh, pools, um, compute the residual pool area depth, uh, current pool depth based on the flow at acquisition, relative elevation to channel, all kinds of information along those lines. Um, this is just a quick comparison of how that approach aligns with um, a topographic survey that was pushed through the CHAMPS methodology, which I'm going to talk about in a second. The surveyors here screwed up their backsite, which is why you're seeing an offset. but. All my little pools from the topo or from the lidar are aligning with the uh, with the pools um, taken from the topographic field survey. Just some more examples of that, and we can push the lidar data itself directly through the same process uh, developed by the Riverscapes Consortium. Here, the credits at the bottom. These guys did something cool. 
Um, and what I love about this objective reproducible, uh, some quick change detection, um, change detection examples. Uh, this is, again is the Tucannon River. You can see how we're what, map, mapping sediment change. Um, and just some changes in the data. Sorry about the beeping that's coming from another window. And a quick difference of how the things have changed over time. Uh, Dungeness River, same kind of change detection. And this is uh, what we've done with this system in the last five years. So the majority of our work has been focused on the East Coast due to hurricanes, um, but there is a lot of work going on in the Pacific Northwest, and this is even a little out of date. So some of the systems that you guys are working in may already have been mapped, and if they're not, we would love to map them for you. Um, so automated channel geometry is still something I'm working on. I want to be able to create this and then push it directly through hydraulic modeling. Um, broad scale geomorphic classification is really just a processing lift that I have somebody working on right now. And then the verification for these models, you know, we're only capturing a single point in time. And so figuring out how to verify um, and calibrate the models um, be super useful. As I said, depth, turbidity, bottom reflectivity and extent, all a big deal. Um, think about exactly what question you're trying to answer with the data in order to design the system. There are some challenges as far as the amount of compute. Um, we can integrate it with thermal imagery, sonar, and building a larger and larger suite of automated objective and reproducible analytics. And with that, I think I'm out of time. Um, so my name is Misha Hay. I have a long, obscure job title. And Steve Raber, if anyone is actually interested in uh, setting up acquisitions or exploring estimates, he's the, the programmer account manager to contact. And that is the end of my presentation. <clears throat> All right, thanks so much, Misha. That was a very cool presentation. Um, and we do have some time for questions. And so just a quick reminder, you can either type your questions into the chat or you can raise your hand using that toolbar icon and we can call on you to unmute yourself. Um, I see that there is a question in the chat already. It says, from a green LiDAR data set, how would you recommend extracting vector features like bell lag or channel width? Is it possible using Esri software? Oh, theoretically, um, um, so center lines, uh, yes, you have to do a little coding uh, in Esri, but I've, I've automated the center lines. Um, the Thalwag, certainly interpretable. Um, the Difficulty there is the, the way that the least cost analysis works. Um, so I'm still working on the, uh, the Thalwag side of things. Um, you, can, you can take a hydrology, a standard hydrologic network approach using flow direction, but breaching the uh, sinks, which are the pools, um, is actually still a bit of a challenge. And theoretically, the least cost path analysis should work, uh, but it's a bit clunky in ARC. And so um, we're actually building out uh, some stuff in open source software with, with machine learning to try, to try to tackle that. All right, thanks. Uh, a question that came in a little earlier. Uh, is the edge of water line an automatic or easily post-processed product that can be derived from the data? Is this typically an extra step or cost or is it routine? It's routine for us. Um, I can't say that it's easy in all situations. I've developed some relatively complicated rule sets and e-cognition to extract. Uh, it depends on the accuracy level that you're after. Um, because we need it in order to refract the data, it's part of our standard deliverables, um, standard intermediate that really anybody that's acquiring this stuff uh, should be providing you. Um, but I can't say 
it's super easy and I'm not going to give you my ECOG rule sets. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. What does the cost per mile tend to be for a topo bathy LIDAR acquisition uh, with sonar? Question mark. So those two questions. <laughs> um, there's really no way for me to answer that. Um, it's all about access, the scale of the project, how complicated the acquisition is due to the timing considerations, um, the, the meander of the stream, wh whether we're in um, canyons, all, all kinds of things factor in. Um, so I, I really can't give a cost per mile, but if you're considering this and want to send uh, an AOI to Steve Raber um, or me and I can pass it along, we can we could certainly work up a quote. It's not, uh, it is more expensive than traditional LiDAR um, and there is definitely economy of scale so uh, if you're only interested in a mile long reach, um, it's probably probably not the best solution. Uh, if you start to get up to 30, 50 miles, um, the, the cost comes way down because we're flying an aircraft at about 100 miles an hour. And so um, the, once we once we position the crew and system and deploy to the site, it gets a lot, um, a lot cheaper. So there's economy of scale. I can't give you a clean number. All right. And I think we've got time for just one more question. Um, is there a minimum size stream that this would be effective for? How does it handle full coverage of overhanging vegetation? Sorry, each question is two questions. <laughs> yep, that's fine. Um, minimum size, you know, if you're trying to get under a, under a meter wide, um, you're starting to, it starts to become a, a limited utility. Um, we can still map the stream, but uh, the spot size for this system is about 50 centimeters. And so, you know, you, you really want your stream to be a few meters wide to be able to detect anything beyond the, the sort of channel center. Um, and then full coverage of overhanging vegetation, just like a, a topographic LiDAR system, a certain amount of energy should penetrate. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, if, it's a, if light does not travel through, then we're not gonna map it. So I can, I can shoot a million points per square meter at a brick wall and never tell you what's on the other side of that brick wall. But if it is a semi-penetrable canopy, um, the point densities we fly typically do get a pretty good resolution underneath canopy in the ground model or bathymetric model. All right. Thanks so much, Misha. Absolutely. All right. So, um, here. Uh, before we get to Phil's presentation, um, we're going to do one last poll. And this is a question posed by Phil uh, to see what kind of experience you all have with various technologies used for collecting and analyzing stream and floodplain data. So, once again, Sam has put the link to Phil's question in the meeting chat. Um, or you could use that code at the top of the screen. So please take a minute to respond. All right, it's looking like we have um, kind of a, a mix of experience levels out there with some people not using any of those or yeah, direct experience with, but um, fair number of people having some or experience with all of them. All right, well, Thanks much for weighing in on that. And I'm going to pass it over to Kevin to introduce Phil. And Phil, if you want to bring up your slides in the meantime. Sure. All right. Yeah. Th uh, thanks, Misha, for the great talk. And uh, our next and uh, last speaker, Batten 
clean up is Phil Roney. Uh, and, you know, I've had the chance to work with Phil in a couple of different contexts over the years. And one of his latest efforts to help the state of Washington develop a monitoring approach for large scale floodplain and riparian restoration projects can be informative for a number of practitioners working on similar projects in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, while Phil has a two page biography, I took the liberty of shortening that to three sentences to just hit the key points. Uh, Dr. Phil Roney has 30 years of experience as a fishery scientist and manages the Northwest Science Team for Kramer Fish Sciences, or CFS. Uh, prior to joining CFS in 2015, he led the watershed program at NOAA's Northwest Fishery Science Center, where he directed scientists conducting habitat research and science to support salmon recovery. Uh, Phil currently is focusing on designing, implementing, and publishing definitive studies to address pressing questions to protection well, related to protection, management, and restoration of aquatic systems and salmon recovery. Uh, his talk today will share what he learned when he and his colleagues completed a review of remote sensing and emerging technologies for use in evaluating floodplain and riparian projects. So uh, welcome, Phil, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ken and Amy, for the um, chance to talk. Um, everybody, can you hear me okay? Ken, you can give me a thumbs up if everything's good on the audio. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about some work we did uh, looking at um, you know, sort of remote sensing and emerging technologies and, and evaluating floodplain restoration projects. Uh, I wanna give you a little background before I get into the, the main meat of the talk and what I'm gonna cover. Um, and, you know, I think it's good to provide some background. I'm not sure if everyone on this call is, is familiar with restoration efforts, but realize that we've been at stream restoration for uh, more than 120 years now, um, earliest efforts being in, in Europe, but, um, you know, we things initially folks were working a lot on small streams, putting structure in the stream, like you see in this top photo here of a CCC crew in Montana in the 1930s. Uh, but the work focused on small streams, fencing, getting cattle out, replanting riparian areas. But uh, that's really shifted in the last 10 years or so, 10 or 20 years. Um, uh, there's been much more focus on restoration of floodplains. Uh, again, we've been doing this for probably really the focus in the last 10 years in the Northwest, though in Europe they've been at this since the 1980s. And there's really been an evolution of some uh, technologies for monitoring floodplains. And you've probably seen this alphabet soup of all the different acronyms for the different kinds of technologies we've been applying, like ADCP, RTK. We had a great talk uh, by Mishan LIDAR, um, SFM, ALS. It's a, it's a bit confusing. So uh, I'm gonna go through some of these um, uh, and, and how we can use these. Um, it's also really important. I don't, I don't think I can stress this enough that a lot of our monitoring approaches were developed for weightable streams. Uh, and when we talk about monitoring floodplain restoration projects, uh, there's some three fundamental differences be between what we've traditionally done for stream monitoring. Number one, and Misha covered some of this, is that we need coverage of the entire floodplain in the side channels, not just the main channel or a few of the side channels. Uh, we need to be able to look at this at not just low flow, um, but also at high flow or a variety of flows because we are talking about a flood plain, uh, meaning that we wanna see where the water gets when it's at flood. Uh, and we need, need to be able to lot monitor large projects. I mean, we've been pushing for, for many years now to get a larger restoration projects implemented. And historically, most restoration projects prior to about 10 years ago were on the order of a few hundred meters. Well, now we're seeing projects uh, like I have in this picture from the middle Ennead on the right that are up to eight you know, kilometers or, or longer in length. And so we need to have approaches that we can monitor the whole floodplain at different flows and on really large projects. And a lot of our traditional monitoring approaches have not lended itself to it. So um, we did a large literature review on, uh, on well, uh, one on effectiveness monitoring of restoration in general, but we focused a literature review on monitoring floodplain projects and looked at a whole bunch of studies that, that, that covered their effectiveness. And so I'm gonna cover um, both what we learned from that, what are what are some of the the traditional 
um, methods for for monitoring streams and floodplains uh, and some of the newer approaches. Um, what are the pro pros and cons of these different methods? And you know, what are our recommendations for monitoring floodplain projects? Uh, and and how does that vary with the size of the project and the number of projects you might be monitoring? Now, as I said, we did a literature review on this, and this originally came from a review that we have more than 700 papers on uh, restoration effectiveness. About 200 of those are on monitoring actually floodplain uh, effectiveness of floodplain projects. The earliest studies go back into the 1980s, and you see that there's really been a growth in the number of studies that are looking at floodplain uh, effectiveness. And this is both because of the popularity of, of the actual restoration of floodplains and a lot of these new emerging technologies. I think the only reason you see that there's not very many studies in 19 and 20 is because we did this review in early 2020 and it takes a while for the literature to get into the, the databases. So here's some of the common metrics that people have been monitoring and continue to monitor on floodplain projects. Uh, channel morphology, mesohabitats, that's pools, riffles, glides, large wood. Um, you know, more than half of the studies, or about half of the studies focus on, on looking at um, uh, mesohabitats, pool riffles, and that type of thing. And that's because they're very important to fish. A quarter of the studies are looking at floodplain morphology. Um, you know, you see about 70, you know, 80 or so of the studies are looking at fish. Uh, so you can see kind of the smattering of the type of things that the most important, I'm gonna, the ones that are kind of bolded here are ones that I'm gonna talk about some of the approaches. I don't have time to talk about all these things, but I'll, I'll, I'll focus on a few of those and some examples. So let's talk about uh, channel and floodplain morphology. So historically, uh, you know, we've done, and in, to this day, we do what we might call a stick and tape survey, which is basically people in the field measuring and counting uh, the pools and, and delineating the pools and riffles. Um, uh, and, you know, we've got some newer approaches. Um, uh, two of these are uh, structure from motion and LIDAR. Uh, uh, Misha's talked quite a bit about LIDAR and gave a real good background on that. Um, the, the, the other thing to keep in mind is when we talk about these surveys, the field um, versus kind of, you know, these field surveys versus remote sensing, the big changes are is with the remote sensing, we can get a couple of those things I talked about that we need for monitoring floodplains. We can get continuous coverage. Um, when we do a traditional field survey, you're, if you're able, if you're just doing a, um, if you're just classifying units, we're not gonna have very high, uh, what you might call point density. If you're using an RTK, you're still not gonna have that high a point density. Um, but with LIDAR, we're gonna get lots of, of points per square meter. Um, we can map the entire floodplain and we can model it at different flows. And this is just a picture from a, a, the Southern Cross project on Catherine Creek in Oregon. And it's showing um, before and after restoration and, and uh, at a bank full flow, how much of the floodplain is now actually uh, uh, inundated and accessible for fish. So um, one of the things that, and I will say one of the other things that's informing my presentation is we did two pilot studies. Uh, one is we compared a bunch of newer uh, floodplain monitoring approaches across four sites in the Columbia Basin. I should say one in, in Western Washington and three in the Columbia Basin to compare a bunch of these different approaches for monitoring floodplain projects, as well as look at some of the new uh, uh, metrics and stuff that have come out of, of uh, some very recent European studies. And so one of the big ones that, that came up is we kept uh, you know, people have talked about using structure for motion versus LIDAR, and I have a, you know, there's an image of structure for motion on a pro uh, here on a project. I believe this might be on the Toucanon, um, and uh, uh, the LIDAR on the on the right. Now, um, and this is LIDAR we flew with a, a, a drone. Uh, you can see this cross section um, that shows the structure from motion. Now, a lot of this site has grass, so you would think that the structure from motion would give you a good representation, but it's getting the surface returns. So what we see is the LIDAR um, is really penetrating the grass, penetrating the vegetation. And in, in a lot of cases, um, the structure from motion is, is off by a meter or, or more. So it's not, it, it can give you a nice image of the surface, but if we're talking about getting the, the, the topography of the terrain, uh, we really got to go with LIDAR. And this is really highlighted by, we accidentally flew over our field vehicle uh, and you'll notice that um, when we 
compare the structure from motion versus the 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 lidar the the structure from motion obviously just maps over you know it's just taking images and um it it it's telling you that the the top of the car is the ground so uh, obviously it's not performing that well but but kind of a neat um demonstration of it's just you know really lidar is the superior uh technology here for this um so the other thing and uh is looking at mapping the bathymetry and i i think uh, misha covered this in in pretty um good detail here uh you know there's a couple ways for getting the bathymetry obviously green lidar um is is kind of the ideal approach and as as misha indicated it's not going to be suitable in all situations and may need to be may need to be coupled with with some sonar or some um, adcp uh, surveys um the other approach for getting it is to use an rtk um, and map uh, the, to the, the depth. Uh, again, there's some depth limitations. You can use an ADCP with a, on a raft or a, um, a drone to get the, the deeper areas. Um, and then you can do some of this with a total station. Again, that's going to be, you're going to be limited in what you can do. But really getting that bathymetry is pretty important so that we can map the habitats that are important for fish and uh, look at the whole uh, floodplain. So habitat units, um, you know, again, historically we've done this with field surveys and we continue to do it. Uh, and with some of the newer technologies with LIDAR and aerial imagery, we can, we can uh, map these a little quicker and more continuously. Um, the, the top image is just a couple people preparing for a, an RTK uh, survey out uh, in Eastern Washington. And then on the bottom is, is classification of habitats with uh, aerial imagery from some work by Massimo Rinaldi uh, on floodplains in, um, in Italy. So um, the field versus the, the remote sensing. Here's, this is a good image of traditional field surveys and what you get and their coverage and what you would get from LIDAR. Uh, so, um, and this is LIDAR we flew with a, a drone on the right, um, though, of course, if you're flying large areas, you're going to want to use a, a fixed wing aircraft. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the image on the left is a, is a CHAMP survey, and you can see the habitat units that have been delineated with CHAMP, and you can see the extent of the survey. Uh, it completely misses um, the uh, entire floodplain. Uh, and that's just a problem with the, the traditional habitat surveys um, and something that, you know, again, why we want to use remote sensing to look at floodplain projects and look at their, their change. The other thing to keep in mind is the CHAMP survey on this with the total station uh, took about three days. Uh, the LIDAR that was flown here with a drone took a few hours. So um, the other thing about classifying the habitats with remote sensing, while we can pick out pools and there's some work that's been done to use this geomorphic unit tool, which was, uh, you know, I, Misha showed this too as well. Um, it, it's a good way of classifying uh, different um, uh, geomorphic units, but it's not exactly consistent with how we're classifying habitats for fish. So what you see is the inset here shows an area that the habitat survey delineated as, as a pool, but the, um, the geomorphic unit tool and some of these other ways of examining the, the geomorphology uh, will get you very detailed. It, it breaks the pool up into several little subunits. And so one of the challenges for using the remote sensing to classify habitat is classifying it into habitats that we know and have good evidence for are meaningful for fish. Uh, so there's still some work to be done on that. Um, I, I was uh, interested in the Forest Service presentation that was last week, I believe, where they were classifying um, uh, riffles, pools, and glides pretty consistently. And so that's that's something to be looking at. But that's one of these things that's being that's kind of in development and still needs to be uh, ground truthed. Uh, large wood. Um, uh, Misha talked about this too as well, using lidar for this. You can see some of the the approaches, the 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 historical or, or approach we still use on small streams, is to actually count and measure each piece of wood. Um, you can use aerial imagery, and it works pretty well when you're looking at um, uh, areas that don't have a lot of vegetation. Or we can use uh, lidar. Um, and which of these is most appropriate? You know, is partly going to depend on your the, the size of the area you're looking at and your questions. Um, 
I, I think one of the other, you know, one, I think what I was trying to say earlier is we had two pilot studies, studies we did along with this, and I forgot to mention the second one, which is on the middle ENIAT, which is a restoration project of about eight kilometers. We did a pilot study to, to, to monitor that um, before and after restoration uh, using a combination of remote sensing and field surveys. And this is some data from that where we basically, it's an eight kilometer long reach. So for us to survey the wood in that reach, uh, would um, take us, uh, would probably take the field crew a week or more. Uh, and in a stream that had higher densities of wood, it would take much longer. But we were able to, a technician using the, the aerial and satellite imagery can delineate the pieces of wood uh, and get good, pretty good counts in the active channel. Uh, this took the technician about uh, five hours to do this, to count all the pieces of the wood, delineate log jams and, and get their location on the floodplain. So really a huge, huge time savings here compared to a traditional survey. The utility of this obviously will depend on what your questions, your monitoring questions are, but in, in this case here, we were just looking for broad scale changes in the patterns of wood. So um, moving to the, um, the uh, another area, and this is not really remote sensing. I think there's a lot of, um, um, there's a lot of emerging technologies and sometimes we refer to them as remote sensing. And I'm not sure if some of these methods for sampling fish fall into remote sensing, but they're definitely some emerging technologies. So historically we've measured fish uh, with snorkeling, like you see these couple of my staff doing snorkel surveys in the ENIAT, um, or we've used electrofishing, uh, mark recapture with either electrofishing or seining. Uh, and we still use those today. And those are methods that require um, getting your hands on the fish or getting in the field and actually measuring them. But there are some newer methods for looking at, um, uh, for estimating the abundance and presence of fish. And one of those is uh, environmental DNA. Now, I'm not gonna give a, go into detail on this, but th suffice to say that by taking a water sample, um, we can determine which species are present. And that's because all, all uh, organisms are sloughing off DNA. So aquatic organisms are, are sloughing off DNA into the water. And by taking a sample, uh, we can process that in the lab and they can determine which, uh, if there's DNA, for, for which species there's DNA presence. Now it's great for presence or absence. Um, you can look at the relative proportion of DNA to say, you know, how much of the DNA is from what organism, but it's not to the point yet that you can actually look at the abundance of fish. And that's partly because the size of the fish or the numbers of the fish will determine how much uh, DNA is in the water and whether, you know, when they were last there, the DNA um, is in a stream is going to be transported downstream, but also some of it's going to settle out. So there's a bunch to be worked out on that, but it's, it's a good way of looking at presence of ab absence of species. Uh, you can look at the otolith microchemistry. The otoliths are the ear bones of the fish. Uh, we can actually take a cross section of that and in the lab, examine the chemistry, compare that to the chemistry of the water in different habitats the fish are found in um, and determine uh, uh, the life history of the fish, the residence time. And, and I should say an otolith is similar to a, uh, a scale in that the fish lays down a layer every, um, actually every day. So you can, it's, it's gonna have the same kind of concentric rings. And then another thing using gen genetics uh, is genetic mark recapture. So um, sometimes called kinship or, or parentage analysis. And basically by taking samples of both the juveniles and adults, uh, and you're able to determine their, their parentage uh, and determine um, whether what the population size is. And this graph here I have on the bottom is just uh, some estimates of how many juveniles or adults, we might need to sample to estimate the total population of fish. And uh, it's also got the different, you know, coefficient of variation. Um, and this is from some work we're doing on monitoring on the Lewis River. But you'll see that, uh, you know, you could, if you want a, a coefficient of variation on your estimate of, of, uh, of about 30%, and you you uh, you could sample a thousand juveniles and as, as few as a uh, hundred adults, to figure out what your total population size is. So again, not exactly remote sensing, but really some emerging technologies that are allowing us to, to, to look at, at, uh, uh, at um, 
to monitor fish in a different way and a much less invasive way, and which is a particularly a big concern, uh, you know, with all the endangered species listings and the difficulty it is to actually handle fish these days. So uh, one uh, another thing that kind of bridges the gap here between um, uh, the physical and the biological monitoring uh, is looking at the habitat suitability. Um, now, if I was uh, if if we were in an audience or I was a little more adept at that tool that that we've been using to 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 uh, query you, I'd ask you how many of you are f familiar with IFIM, the in-stream flow incremental methodology, which was developed in the 70s and 80s, and it was really the state of the art for determining what are the adequate in-stream flows for, um, for fish. Uh, and there's the PHAB SIM part of that, or the habitat suitability part of that model that would look at um, whether the streams were, what's the amount of suitable habitat at different flows. Now, historically, the way this was done was you took cross sections throughout a reach, uh, a representative number of cross sections. You looked at the flow, uh, the, the depth and the velocity at those cross sections at different flows. We went out and measured, um, we developed uh, people have developed um, habitat suitability curves, depth and velocity curves for different fish species. And you'd, you'd calculate based on those depth and velocity preferences, say for juvenile Chinook, you'd determine how much suitable habitat was at those cross sections, interpret, interpolate between those to come up with how much suitable habitat there was for a species. Well, now with with these complete uh, surveys using, uh, you know, uh, bathymetric or green light R uh, or with any other type of, of survey where we get the full bathymetry and topography, uh, we can and with some hydraulic modeling, we can model the entire river to look at what the habitat suitability is. Um, we've developed a tool for doing this that should be online sometime this coming year. We developed for the Grand Ronde Model Watershed to, um, to run uh, HSI models for a variety of species uh, and, and input the, the outputs of the hydraulic model data. Uh, it'll do it really quickly. Uh, this is a 40 kilometer reach in this photo of the Metau River. I believe it took about 10 minutes, which was one which was fairly long. Uh, to run the HSI model. This is for juvenile Chinook. I have a little zoom in here on, on an inset showing the, um, the areas that are suitable for Chinook uh, in the floodplain. Again, this is at a bank full flow. But the beauty of this is it allows us coupling the remote sensing data with our ability to model this data quickly. Uh, you can look at the habitat suitability at different flows for different species. Um, and the tool we've developed for this, you can you can uh, select different preference curves or input your own preference curves for different species of fish. So um, another key component that's often looked at is temperature, uh, and I'm not going to go into a, a detailed um, uh, description of of, uh, of FLIR or or thermal infrared imagery, um, but it's been used uh, to map uh, cool water areas. There's some, you know, really a, initial work done by uh, Christian Torgerson that looked at mapping uh, 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 cool water refuges, and um, there's a good review on this by uh, Hancock and some others on, on this type of technology, uh, but this image just shows, you know, kind of the, the, the differences in temperature in the cool water areas of a, a large uh, uh, a whole watershed. The advantages of doing this is you get broad coverage. I mean, that's been one of the key problems with temperature monitoring, similar to some of our other monitoring, is you're usually, we're, you're either getting a, a, a just a point estimate or you're putting a data logger out there and getting a continuous measurement, but just for one location. So this gives you broad coverage, can ide identify cool water or, or warm water areas. Uh, and really, this helps you pinpoint where you might want to do some um, more continuous monitoring with data loggers. The downside is this, uh, uh, similar to other remote sensing, it's a snapshot in time. Uh, so if you're going to, if you want to look at it through time or in different seasons, you're going to have to repeat it. It's getting you surface temperatures, so it's not getting bottom temperatures. Uh, it can be costly to repeat. Um, 
there are you can do some of this on shorter reaches with the drone, but there are some challenges with the technology. Um, and then, uh, you know, the spatial and temporal resolution, you're, you're, you, can, you can cover a broad area, but it, it's not, it's uh, a snapshot in time. There are some other approaches for monitoring uh, temperature. Um, there's, uh, there's also, um, uh, you can just map the temperatures. We were mapping this reach with an RTK, so we put a uh, temperature probe on the, the target so that we could map all the, the temperatures on the, the, the sort of a temporobathometric survey and it shows what the the temperatures are along the bottom of the stream uh, another some other approaches are where you can you can place a um, a fiber optic cable along this bed of the stream that will measure it continuously uh, but again that's a that's something that's uh, a little bit costly and probably limited to to a small area so riparian vegetation is really another area that we really want to monitor with floodplains. And, you know, um, historically and also to this day, we, we've done uh, field surveys where you go out and actually measure the plants and, and count them and identify them. Uh, and both with uh, aerial imagery and LIDAR, that's changed a lot. So this is some work uh, looking at um, uh, false color orthophotos, this one on the right. And they were able, they can, you know, showing how you can classify the different types of vegetation. Uh, you can, um, yeah, so that's, and then there's, we can use LIDAR to look at, 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 at uh, different species and that. So this has really come a long way, though, if you want to get down to survival of plants uh, and really down to, to very specific species counts, you're going to need to do some, still need to do some field surveys. Hey, Phil, this is Amy. You have about five minutes to wrap up. Perfect. I, I think I'm right on schedule. Um, so uh, some common let's let's I want to kind of start to summarize here. So that was perfect that Amy just interjected because that's my cue. Uh, so let's talk about some common metrics that are monitored for floodplains and which types of remote sensing actually does the best job at, at estimating those. So um, there are a number of things we can use to look at channel morphology. Um, and I've got LIDAR, whether it's uh, bathymetric LIDAR or, or traditional um, near-infrared LIDAR coupled with uh, bathymetric survey, can address many of the things that we're looking for. I'll give you a good, uh, the channel, mortho for, morth <laughs> channel morphology, the topography, the different habitat units. We can look at floodplain inundation, um, the, the number of side channels, uh, by the way, these are all parameters that um, the surfboard is looking at uh, for monitoring and BPA as well as looking at for monitoring floodplain projects. Uh, and we see that, that you know, um, you can do it with some of these technologies, but, you know, LIDAR coupled with some, either green LIDAR or LIDAR coupled with some type of bathymetric survey is going to be the best. When it gets to temperature, you know, um, they're, they're still, you know, uh, probably need to be coupled with some field surveys or placing some uh, data loggers. So for the riparian metrics, uh, there's a lot of these, and you know, really what this tell you, what this the the take home on this with all these different things that we want to look at, which is often the composition, the stem density, whether we've got survival, the species diversity. Uh, you know, we can look at some of these with LIDAR, uh, particularly the, the area of the vegetation, the growth, the, uh, the organic inputs, but um, and some of these other methodologies, structure from motion or multispectral imagery, aerial photography or satellite imagery really can't do this. So for most of the riparian metrics, it's, you know, LIDAR coupled with um, uh, some field surveys is going to be the best way to measure those. So one of the things I want to talk about, uh, and I think I've probably got about two minutes left, is um, the challenges here. Uh, you know, I, I will say that we've really, there's some really great things we can do with remote sensing, but, you know, the new isn't always better. They're going to save field time, but there's a lot more office and lab time that's going to be spent processing some of these data. It The remote sensing is not a panacea. It's not going to eliminate the need for field work. Um, often it needs to be, the, the remote sensing needs to be ground truth and combined with some other techniques. You've got higher equipment costs and complexing, uh, complex processing, which 
you know, means that um, uh, you're going to need some well-trained people to, to process some of this data. Uh, really, when we were doing this review, we were looking to see if there were some new technologies that, that had been overlooked. And, you know, LIDAR and some of these other methodologies have actually been around a little while. What's really changing is the analytical methods. Uh, we see most of the new papers out there are on, on ways to process the data because the, the analysis of this is catching up to the tech and technology. So we're still working out some of the ways to, to, to calculate these things such as, um, you know, different habitat units and that stuff. Uh, I, you know, it's, the monitoring question should really de- drive what your, you know, what's your approach and whether the, the, a certain type of remote sensing might be a cost effective way to do it. Certainly, it's going to be more precise in some cases, but you may not need it depending on what your um, the scale of the project you're looking at and the size of the streams. Uh, and we've tried to get at some of this by looking at the size of the river and the size of the restoration project somebody might be monitoring. If you're really talking small streams, small project, something that's 500 meters or less, it may be beneficial to just stick with traditional field surveys or using an RTK or a total station to map these sites because it's probably not going to take that long. And the acquisition costs for flying LIDAR can be pretty pretty substantial. Um, uh, when we get into larger streams, some combination of field and remote sensing is going to be best. And when we get into the big streams and, uh, and like a lot of the stuff that Misha was showing, you know, your best option is going to be, be remote sensing and most likely uh, uh, bathymetric LIDAR. So um, just to kind of summarize and take this home, there's, there's been some rapid advances in floodplain monitoring, particularly these remote sensing methodologies. You know, when you look at the different types, the one that really stands out is we can map large areas with, with LIDAR and we get continuous coverage. Um, you know, not all these new methods are going to be best for all of your applications. The monitoring question, the scale, and the cost are still going to drive what's your most appropriate methods. Ideally, from what we've seen, some combination of LIDAR coupled with field surveys is going to be the best and most efficient way to monitor floodplain and riparian projects. Um, the biggest advances we're seeing in recent years are not so much in the remote sensing uh, in, in a, a new type of remote sensing, but in how you're processing that, that data. Uh, there's some couple of good papers that you can look at. Um, uh, Tom said, uh, and Leyland gives a good review of remote sensing in river corridors. Um, Harris et al. talks about uses of drones in fishery science. And then our paper uh, is um, the review and, and has a lot of the information that I covered in this presentation. So, uh, Thanks for your time. And with that, I think I have time for a couple questions. Yes, <clears throat> there are definitely time for questions. Um, so again, you can either put them in the chat or you can raise your hand using the toolbar icon. Um, and then I do see a question in the chat already. For Phil, uh, what sensor was used to collect the FLIR data you showed? Uh, that FLIR data is from another, that study that was, um, it's from Hancock uh, 2012. So I would um, direct you to that paper about that particular uh, sensor that they used. All right. Uh, it looks like uh, we have a question from Alex. You want to unmute yourself? Okay. Sure. Hi, Phil. This is Alex Lincoln um, with King County. Um, I was curious about your habitat suitability index tool. Um, the Rivers Group with the county has been working on something um, similar. Um, so far, we're only basing our tool based on depth and velocity from hydraulic model outputs. And so I'm curious if your tool also incorporates the um, habitat suitability curves for substrate and cover in addition. Um, well, those are additional curves we can add to it right now. Uh, and I would actually, if Kai Ross is on the line, he might, if we have time, he might be able to answer that because he's the one who's been working on this. Yes, uh, this is Kai Ross. Um, we, we do have substrate and cover curves built in. I mean, they're just taken from some older papers. And if you have the data to support it, then the tool will allow you to use it. Thanks, Kai. 
All right, uh, from the chat, uh, can you talk about the project with Washington Surfboard to develop the monitoring approach slash protocol that combines a suite of monitoring techniques? Yeah, so we were asked to, uh, we were contracted to develop a monitoring plan for large floodplain projects for the surfboard. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we it, it has our, I mean, we outline all the questions. I mean, it was you know, basically a full monitoring program. Um, and they're still in, uh, I think they're in discussions as to, to whether, when they're going to implement that. Uh, but basically, we laid out an approach for evaluating large floodplain projects that uses a combination of of uh, of lidar coupled with some field surveys to monitor changes in um, you know riparian condition, uh, a bunch of those floodplain metrics that you saw there. Um, yeah, and so that's got that that should be publicly available. Uh, and uh, that that outlines the details of that. I don't right. know if there was some specific question about that. I'm not sure I answered that. All right. Well, um, Ken, if you want to ask a follow up, you can throw that in the chat. We'll move on to the next question. No pieces. Thanks. That's good. Um, so can Kai speak to the remotely sensed cover classification he is developing for HSI and drone imagery? Hi, uh, this is Kai again. Yeah, so um, one of the things that we're working on right now is to be able to, as he mentioned, uh, generate sort of automatic cover classification for aquatic systems using uh, RGB uh, imagery. Um, although if you were here for the talk, not one week, but two weeks ago, um, you saw some of the kind of trials and tribulations that, that come with that. So we're looking into how we can kind of uh, process this additional RGB imagery to sort of hopefully come up to make the standard for HSI be a depth, velocity, and cover. All right. Thanks, Kai. Uh, any, well, actually, we're kind of, we've had five minutes of questions for Phil. So why don't we go ahead and just open it up? Uh, questions for Phil or Misha or for both. Can I ask Misha a question? This is Phil. Yeah, go for it, Phil. At Misha, I was uh, my question was with the lidar, the um, the uh, topographic versus the bathymetric lidar. Is there any advantages uh, to using for if you're looking at riparian vegetation? Um, are there any advantages over the topographic versus the bathymetric lidar if you're purely just interested in in riparian and conditions and looking at changes in veg? Uh, there's actually disadvantages. Um, hmm. There's a the the wavelength for the topographic system was was chosen largely because it penetrates um, vegetation and, and is more sensitive to the return because it's outside the visible spectrum from what I understand. It's getting a little outside my expertise. But uh, looking at the data, we often get um, slightly better ground penetration with the NIR systems. Um, the latest and greatest systems are really moving towards dual wavelength. So um, the the Regal system that we that most of the data I showed today, uh, that's actually got an associated NIR system in it. And so we can deliver a, a merged point cloud to get kind of the best of both worlds. And then some um, some companies, Regal included, and Optech came out with one a while ago. Uh, they're looking at dual wavelength systems. So the, the hope is you can actually pull some vegetation health information out of the ratios and relationships between the green and the NIR, just like you would mm -hmm. for a, an NDVI type project. I'm skeptical of the noise to signal ratio on that kind of a model, just from what I, because I know too much about intensity and how it's absorbed and, and validated um, in the system. But um, for, for uh, the, oh, I, I guess I answered that question and I won't keep rambling. And just, uh, <laughs> anything else. That, that was great. Thanks. Yeah. All right, any other questions? 
going once, going twice. All right, um, then we'll consider the questions concluded. Um, and I just have a few more things I wanna share with you guys. So I'm gonna take control. Hey, screen Amy, back. this is uh, Seth, sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you, Seth. Yeah, sorry, I'm slow off the draw. I was trying to find that unmute button. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciated both presentations. They were both really good and informative. And um, something Phil said really struck me because I've been thinking about it recently about, um, you know, the real cutting edge with this kind of work and research is how to process the data. And I see that as getting, you know, very highly technical and it almost seems like, um, you know, like a new field emerging of people who are going to have these really technical skills. Um, however, that kind of poses a problem for smaller programs who either need to learn how to do that themselves um, or they need to contract out with these bigger companies. Um, I think my question is, do you, either of you see these kind of processing tools converging anytime in the future so that they're more accessible to like the average uh, fisheries manager in a watershed or are they just going to exponentially get more complicated and we're just going to have a bunch of coders all over the Columbia River Basin doing the science for us? Uh, well, I can I can give you my two cents first. Um, I mean, from first of all, I'm not someone who's doing the coding. Uh, but um, from what I see, uh, a lot of this is getting done in R or Python, and um, you know some of it's going to be publicly available, you know, freely available code to to process some of this stuff. I mean, I think initially what you're going to see is that that it's going to be going to, you know firms and individuals that have the in-house capability but it's it's gonna you know it's gonna get um i think some of it will be just become common scripts and code that will be available yeah i would i would agree with that phil um as some of this stuff is definitely coming out of the research communities and so though not necessarily super easy GUIs to push stuff through, um, pretty decent papers on the technology. Um, like Phil said, a lot of it is built in open source libraries. Um, my fear is, is with that comes a lot of risk for the end user. Um, the more, the less understanding that the data processors have, the more chance for error and misunderstanding of the accuracy of their results and things along those lines. So um, while I expect more tools to become available, the interpretation of the results from those is still gonna be really significant. Um, so for large scale stuff where you're working with a vendor, I, I currently and for the foreseeable future would recommend trying to work with that vendor to get the, the final analytic products you're looking for. Um, but I know that a lot of people are doing their own UAV collects at this point, and um, you will just need somebody technical who understands the data. But it's not necessarily a lot of, you don't necessarily need to be a coder to do it. You just need to understand the, the data itself. Thanks both of you for the answer and for the presentations. All right, um, now we are out of time. So um, I wanna thank everyone for attending and for the interesting questions. And a big thanks to our speakers, Misha Hay and Phil Roney. Uh, we did record today's webinar. That video will be posted to PNAMP's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And it will also be linked on the ETIS landing page. Uh, the next topic in the webinar series is eDNA. Phil kind of talked briefly about that today. Um, we'll be hosting three webinars on the topic, and I'll show you that schedule in just a second. Um, the schedule for January's fish monitoring and assessment topic is coming together at the moment, and uh, we'll be sharing that schedule in an upcoming PNAMP newsletter. 
And if you don't already get PNAMP's uh, monthly newsletter, but if you would like to, uh, Sam's going to drop a link in the meeting chat right now to make it easy for you to sign up for the PNAMP listserv. Um, and then we also um, always post all the updates to the schedule on the ETIS landing page as well. Uh, so here's that schedule uh, for eDNA. Uh, like this series on aerial monitoring, uh, eDNA webinars will be Tuesdays at 1 Pacific. And the format's going to be just a little different in that there'll be uh, one 45-minute long presentation followed by uh, Q&A. Um, I don't know if we'll fill an entire 45 minutes with Q&A, but uh, we have that time set aside. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that we'll be sending a questionnaire to folks that attended the aerial monitoring webinars, and we're looking for your feedback on how the webinars went and also uh, ideas for future events. So it should take less than five minutes to complete. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, I should be sending that tomorrow. And that concludes today's webinar. So thanks for sticking around to the end and have a great day.